for it. This is Flotilla Friday, uh, Friday the 13th, uh, May 13th, uh, 2022. Yes, I, was, I have an agenda item for today, something I'd really like help thinking through or just to propose to see what people what people's thoughts are that I think are very, is very flotilla e. So that's me. I can either dive in, but I didn't know what other people had. And Michael has his hand up. Again. So, yeah, let's see if Michael's able to talk. Yeah. Let's see if I'm able. Um, you guys tell me that you can't hear me if you can't hear me. OK. Are you, can you hear me? <laughs> the good thing we yeah, can we hear can you hear ask you. that question then. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, OK. Um, yeah, just to the to the question earlier that I'm thinking about in terms of, you know, I wanted to ask you about Pete in terms of developing the website um, and speaks to the whole, you know, what what you'll find on Catalyst, what you'll find on whatever platform. Um, I keep stressing to me the, the definitional issue of what Meta Project is in the eyes of a newbie and what Lionsburg is and and Pete, you make the distinction, you know, I think interestingly about my hashtag Meta Project um all over text one word use of meta project versus meta project capital m capital p versus when it's associated with lionsburg or not because it, it seems so critical to me to for onboarding other people that that you know lionsburg doesn't own the meta project and that you know Catalyst or Factor or Massive Wiki doesn't own the directory of the Meta Project. That the Meta Project is bigger than us. But I I may be like wrong in in approaching it that way. Maybe Meta Project because it's it's something that I want to talk to um, uh, Jordan and I have had some talks about branding and you know and branding Lionsburg versus branding. Meta project versus branding lines meta project to me mm -hmm. seems like a, a an important question. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm just I'm just putting that out there just to emphasize that that feeling of of what people get when they encounter us talking about this thing, um, and and ask the question of like how Pete you're addressing that in what you're doing with with Lionsburg space capital M meta space capital P project it, that that seems like a thing <laughs> um, definitely a thing because we're having trouble talking about it <laughs> so it needs to eventually figure itself yeah. out for sure yeah yeah um, uh, it's it's a yeah. little it's a little I, I, I had <laughs> it's a, very I, meta. I, I think I back channeled Michael about this earlier today. It's like, dude, I really turned out I really needed the lowercase meta project. Um, it was a super helpful concept to have um, this week. Um, Wendy, is it okay if we dig in on, on this a little bit? And then. Oh, it totally is. And it actually relates to what I was going to bring up because cool. <laughs> the idea I have um, helps, in my mind, helped me to define what meta, <laughs> what meta project is. So I'm happy to approach it that way first. If you want to describe mine, go for it, whatever. Um, I'll, I'll go for it and, and maybe try to tell the story of um, the, the lowercase one for me really popped. It, it was conceptual when Michael was bringing it up on a Zoom call. And then this week it was like, oh, I get it. Um, because somebody who's involved in the capitalized meta project, um, it's like, okay, let's do this thing. And I, I could tell that, that they were thinking that the meta project kind of is this container for stuff, right? And, and it's the owner of these sub projects and stuff like that. And I'm like, dude, you know, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm doing a thing and I'm going to keep doing this thing. And, you know, whether or not, you know, Jordan likes it or doesn't like it or whatever, I think it's part of, you know, 
lowercase the meta project and i'm going to keep doing it <laughs> um so i guess i guess this was uh it was creating uh the uh creating the community of practice uh practitioners guild for harvesting and composting um and and um it and it surprised me even and it surprised a few folks it's like okay but pete you're talking about this you know community of practice and you're going let's go talk to people who aren't in the meta project and include them in this guild and i'm like yeah of course that you know of course you don't have to be in the capitalized meta project to be part of this community of practice because it's a autonomous sovereign right um and you know and i'm working on behalf of the lowercase meta project you know like i've been doing for and then i i think back to some of the things that i've been doing that align with meta project i've been doing it for 10 20 30 years um and it's like you know that's you know whether or not you call it the meta project that's what it is kind of so it really brought into sharp focus for me the you know we we can't we can't pretend that we own the meta project or lionsburg can't pretend that it owns the meta project um when there are people who don't even know about lionsburg like 10 years ago i didn't know about lionsburg and i was doing you know lowercase meta project things um even now you know somebody who's working on the stuff that you know is meta project ish lowercase you know you wouldn't say oh you know i you can't do that because it's not capitalized meta project it doesn't make sense or whatever it's like the lowercase one um so uh so the other thing i wanted to mention in there um and this is a little bit off the top well it's on the topic of the name of meta project uh and it's a little maybe a challenge or a, a thing of interest for michael and jordan um grace did a really funny thing on uh the ogem call yesterday um where grace got started talking and she's like and um, you know, and she wanted to say something about meta project capital, you know, capitalized. She didn't say capitalized, but she meant, you know, the meta project. She says, that's a funny, it's a funny name. It's a pretentious name. I'll call it the pretentious project. <laughs> and she just kept going, you know, and I'm like, I had to laugh. And it's like, you know, because <laughs> in her grace way, she's entirely correct, you know, and, and you know, I, I can't say no, it's, you know, not the pretentious project. There really is a thing called the you know, capital M, capital P meta project. And it's like, that's the way it is. You know, people are going to see us and perceive us the way it is. And even me, you know, sometimes I'm working for Lionsburg and Jordan and it's the capital M, capital P. And sometimes I'm doing my thing and I think it's meta project and, you know, it's the lowercase one. So it's a little confusing, a little bit hard to grok, but it's, it's a thing and all of those things. Jonathan, you had your hand up. Do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, I think uh, I'll try and be quick. Um, there's the way I hear what you're saying, Pete, <clears throat> resonates really strongly with me in the sense that we're all coming from wherever we were before we joined up here and probably did a lot of thinking along the way and are continuing to do it after we arrived. Um, and I, for one, also have ideas that are not incorporated into capital M, capital P. Um, and, you know, I'm, I can contribute them or not. And I'm gonna continue to hold on to them because they're precious to me. Um, that's how I hear what you're saying. And it's like a relief to hear someone else say it. And I think that's so, that's why what you're focusing on, Pete, is so important. Because I think it's generally a new concept for most people to be operating with other people this way or other organizations or organizations to be operating with each other this way. And we default so quickly to who owns what who's, who's gets, who gets to make the final decisions on what, and we don't even, 
we don't even realize we're doing it right most of the time. And it's so cool. It ha can happen so quickly where we just kind of throw up our hands and go, well, I don't agree with them and I'm out of here or right. Like, <laughs> which comes from that seeming that, that architecture of only one person gets to make the decisions and this person's not listening to me. And so my voice isn't being heard. And so I'm out of here, right. Instead of the, I have something to contribute. You have something to contribute. We're struggling to contribute something together. Right. And, and sometimes this might, you know, your thing might take the lead, but sometimes my thing might take the lead. And it's more about the thing than it is about the people. And I think mean, that's a lot. That's a lot of new stuff for a lot of people. Um, I, you know, what I, what I've been thinking as an extension from the last two, two ODM calls. And I had a, um, I had a conversation with Klaus yesterday to, to start to shepherd my idea forward. Um, what's interesting. So I'm going to start with the meta version of this since that's what we're talking about, but then I want to get into the details because it's a real, real interoperability question. And that's kind of wanna, why I wanted to bring it to Flotilla. So first the, the bigger stuff. Um, when the idea came to me, I realized for me, it really helped me see what meta is doing is, is trying to figure out what, an, what the process is by which people collaborate together, right? Figuring out what the sovereigns are is part of that process. Um, when someone brings something forward and gives a presentation, says, this is what I'm doing, this is my project, what happens after that <laughs> becomes a new process. How do we include these people into the larger community? What's the response of the larger community to this person? What's our responsibility to reacting to that person? Do we su provide support? What is it that they need? Do we try to match them? All of that becomes a new process that you might say if you if you threw forward the idea like okay let's make a business plan or okay let's make a marketing you know marketing plan there are plenty of people in the world who know what that is what that looks like how to do it what kinds of tasks and people and skills we need in the room in order to make that happen but when we say how do we work collaboratively everybody goes i there's a lot of stuff and we've been talking about it for years and we're still not sure what the process is and so to me that's the experiment of meta as a whole, meta project little, little m, the little p, is operationalizing. You put that word in, Jonathan, in the chat. I liked that, right? Operationalizing, creating the process by which we understand this. And once we get it to something that's a slightly repeatable, like it almost like it's a new scientific method, right? We've got to practice it and then go, oh, no, this is working. This makes sense to other people. Other people can replicate this. Um, they can use it in other places. But right now, we, we, I realized we need experiments to run through. Like if we come up with some semblance of a new process, it's almost like we need an experiment to run through the process to see if the process works. And so that's kind of what had come to me out of the last OGM call a week ago, Thursday, was Klaus had been so, he's done so much research in the area of regenerative agriculture. He's so clear about what, where the edge is, where the edge of need is and where the leading questions are and where that I realized, oh, actually it just, it, it sparked the idea of that could be a great experiment. And then what would that experiment look like was what I started to play with. And how could, how could say Klaus as the focus and OGM and, Meta project and some other things start to work together to 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 as as one just one idea advance regenerative agriculture just a little bit. So I did a flow and I posted that to Mattermost and I um, under the OGM calls and I um, talked about it a little bit yesterday and then Klaus and I followed up with a meeting. And which was great, right? So in my mind, I'm starting, I'm gonna probably end up with another flow. I'm still letting it percolate. But what I'm already seeing that's really related to Flotilla is he could really use, he really, it's re, not him, right? It's regenerative agriculture <laughs> needs to, needs to just like meta projects, not Jordan, right? I, regenerative agriculture needs to be a more of a thing in the world. And where what, he, what, what Klaus's research has shown him is the leading edge of a lot of the friction is in education. It's just not getting out to people what they need to know. And so we talked a lot about that, but we also talked about some infrastructure. We talked about some branding. We talked about um, how to create action, you know, in people, which is, which is part communication and part education, but it can be some other things too. We talked about some governance. He had a huge idea around the govern kind of a governance piece of it. So it spoke to me again, okay, validation that this is a good opportunity to maybe practice if we say just even in this group, right, went, okay, if regenerative agriculture just happened to be the topic, 
what would Jonathan do with seriously, right, to help map or research or codify or coalesce stuff that's already known, maybe we do and right, like that could go its own, that could be a whole, whole little thing. What would Michael contribute to that in terms of not only factor streams, but his experience with branding and right, whatever his network could bring to bear. Um, what could Vincent do in terms of a place, a repository for people to start coming together and engaging on the material that we're, that we're generating? I mean, I'm just throwing these things out, right? And then there'd be like, how do we get all that to come together, right? And that, how do we get it all to come together to me is meta, right? Is meta project, little, um, little P. That's the, how, how do we provide a process by which these things are woven? And so I was very clear with Klaus. I said, if my idea works, the, the, it only works well, if it doesn't add more work to Klaus. So it's not like Klaus comes in and gives a presentation and then we all throw this stuff at him and he has to figure it out. That's, that's good if people are looking for input and research and all that kind of stuff. But it's, it's about another group going away, doing their own thinking about it in focused on that particular topic or need. And then meta working to weave it, to sense make it, to codify it some and to create some bridges you know, pushing forward that interoperability piece a little bit more, not just between people, but also through infrastructure and, and, and technology so that Klaus is supported, not, it's not a brain dump onto Klaus, right? That we, that we lift him up and say, oh, you're working with Sierra Club and you're trying to get them to, to market this information out to their entire network, but you've been stuck there for three years because what if the, the group came together and and one of the ideas that was born was either new content written in new ways or some videos got made or right like just proposing that stuff back to him and him getting to pick this is good this is good this is good i think these are the right and then it becomes a collaborative thing maybe it lasts a couple of weeks maybe it lasts a couple of months that's up to the people anyway so um, to me it's more about the flow it's more about the process so that's my that's my thought which speaks both to what is meta project and how can flotilla help and trying to action, you know, create collaborative action. I, I like it. Um, and I have some stories to tell. Um, so, uh, so there's enough stuff on, I, I was wondering if we would just take notes in chat, but there's enough stuff that I started to hack and be so um let me um let me share my screen and um and then share the hack md i'm kind of torn i've got a bunch of windows up but i don't think you can see anything like embarrassing i was shopping for fidget toys on aliexpress earlier today um which i find embarrassing to share but um but i don't think you can see them so <laughs> um so uh so i uh let's see so um let me share this first and to share this i make write everyone and then i copy that and then i find the zoom chat not that everybody has to participate on this, but um, um, but there's enough stuff floating that. Um, okay, so uh, so for topics, uh, we've got compare and contrast. I'm going to add. Um, Actually, maybe, maybe not. I don't know if that belongs in there. And Wendy, what would you say the, how would you, how, what's the name that you would give the, the idea that you've got for helping Klaus? Uh, you, sorry, you're muted. Uh, Wendy, you're muted. Uh, 
Uh, is Wendy muted for everybody else? Sorry, my bad. No worries. Um, yeah, so the flow I'm calling the flow of, for collaborative action. I mean, maybe it's like the meta project process, you know, or something, but I feel like that's too meta and it's really a flow we're working again outside and inside of meta. It's really not specific. So, so for, say that again, so for collaborative action. Um, and maybe if you don't mind, capital F, capital C, capital A. Don't at all. Uh, and starting with Klaus and regenerative egg. egg. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, Um, so I, I like this and I see it differently. So I, I guess I'm going to jump back a bit to this topic, but then we'll come back and talk about regenerative agriculture. Um, so can't spell. I forgot how to expel experiment. Um, so so I think, you know, we could look around, we could look through the past, we could look around now, we could say, these people are working for, as, as part of the meta project, right? So Klaus is essentially generic meta project because he's working on the thing that's, however Jordan says it, um, the highest purpose of, you know, everyone or something like that. So just generically, he's working in a meta project way. Um, I, I think a, a suggestion I have, I guess, a, a way that I kind of think about why we would um, have a capitalized meta project. And this, is, this kind of is something that anybody can also borrow without really understanding what they're doing, right? Um, you know, hey, I'm in Africa and I'm working on water wells and growing trees um, and, you know, hashtag meta project. Oh, so you, and uh, can I just interject for a sec? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'd flipped the terms, I think, which is also interesting to me. The capital M yeah. capital P is the yeah. version that can't be defined. <laughs> right. Yeah, Let, let's keep talking through that. Um, uh, because, you know, obviously, if I want to hashtag meta project, and I've never heard of meta project, I've never heard of Lionsburg, I'm in Africa, working on water wells and trees, right. I'm probably going to capitalize it, <laughs> I use it as a hashtag. It's just interesting. Um, yeah. I mean, to me, uh, to me, it's like those, those things that are, I, these are some of the other circles that I, that I run in, but like, if you're spirit versus spirit, right? mm -hmm. like yeah. you can, the capital yeah. S is the one that like all like all is yeah. one, right? Gets gets capitalized. Yep, yep. Um, the way I'm thinking, and I'm thinking of it differently. Um, like the generic one, I would lowercase, and then the specific one, I would uppercase, capitalize, um, because this is less work and this is more work. If that makes sense, it's like you're, you're making maybe even maybe even the meta project or something like that. So, so anyway, um, another thing, another exhibit I have for this is, oh, there's the, the Meta Projects Zoom Room. Let's look at Mattermost. The way, I, I like the way I wrote this. Um, Peter Kaminsky is a hashtag Meta Project sovereign. And to the extent that we want to, um, I, I think, 
the difference between a generic um, And thanks, Michael, for gluing this together for me and calling that yet another mm -hmm. phrase. Um, uh, I, I think what we want to do, and I don't know, I don't, I don't know, and I really don't really care what the name is, but I think we want to say, you know, if if you want to identify yourself as a Lionsburg Meta Project sovereign, and maybe sovereign is a part of that word too, or whatever word we want to replace sovereign with. But um, uh, so Meta Project sovereigns follow a couple of core principles. Um, and Um, I think I just stuck something in the chat. Yeah, I like it. Relevant. Oh Sorry. I don't, I don't trust my connection, but I thought related. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we need uh, Lionsburg Meta Project needs to say if you're a Lionsburg Meta Project sovereign, there's a few things that you do. Um, so, and I think it's that you're autonomous, uh, sovereign. Um, that uh, you communicate your mission or something like that. I really think, Michael, your your analogy there to the environmental movement is brilliant. <laughs> really, I mean, it's such an it makes it so much clearer instantly. You know, I think for people, everyone can relate to that. Um, I think the only thing that that Meta Project does that the environmental movement doesn't, but that's no judgment there. It's just no no one's really I think doing it effectively yet is the collaborative piece. There's a potential here to try to bring things together to collaboratively in a way that say environmental defense fund, Sierra Club, Greenpeace, League of Conservation Voters aren't aren't making efforts and nor do they need to necessarily to collaborate together. I think in the case of Meta Project, we're, we're making efforts to collaborate together um, to work towards similar things together. And I think that's why the mapping becomes so important because we're looking for where are the synergies where we can, we can make our efforts more efficient, right? So if the Environmental Defense Fund, which, really, which is in a, really born of a, of a legal space and Sierra Club, which is born of an you know, environmental conservation, right? And <clears throat> League of Conservation Voters, which is, really, which is in some ways more about, more about um, governance Right. What if those three had overlapping pieces and they were trying to coordinate on the overlapping pieces so that the system as a whole could benefit from all three and not not be du not duplicate the efforts. And right. So I hear that's what I hear in the meta projects. Everyone coming to that space is recognizing we don't need 25 platforms. Three would be would be an improvement. Right. We don't need 16 different organizations being funded, trying to figure out the new governance. We could probably narrow that down quite a bit and all the funding could be going to, to four or five and or one. Right. And that's what I hear. That's the difference. But I love I love the analogy for the for the simplicity of understanding how sovereigns versus a uh, versus the uh, uh, a general, you know, <laughs> a, a general movement towards something is working. And I know that's why I feel like movement's not quite the right word, but it is kind of the right word. And I know we keep uh, dipping I'm into that when it's coming risk, out. We don't have a word. I'm going to risk interjecting here and see if I can hold my connection. Um, yeah, I, I almost think that we when you think about the environmental movement or you think about the civil rights movement or you think about you know the so-called women's movement um nobody nobody like you know people try to be primary advocates people try to be the most likely talking head you know 
um, you know, for a while, Jesse Jackson got to be the person who got called on a network, you know, to be a network talking head more likely than any other one person with regard to the civil rights movement post MLK. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I mean, that didn't make him the president of anything or give him any power. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the idea that we're going to be more efficient, like the environmental, would the environmental movement be more efficient if there was some coordinating force that said, okay, EDF, you do this and Sierra Club, you do that, you do that. Sure, but that's never going to happen. And so to recognize that the Met project is something bigger than us that we can't get control of, but we can help forge connections that are let it recognize itself in the way the environmental movement does or the civil rights movement does as a movement to be a global thing. It, like, I was kind of half joking saying the Lionsburg Fund for Advancement of the Meta Project is just a way to recognize if you substitute the word environment there or the environmental movement or civil rights, mm -hmm. it's like it's thing that's trying to recognize who's already doing stuff to like support them more than administrate over them yeah. and not like point them to you would be more efficient if you stop doing that and you start doing that. We don't have that right, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. So it's, it's a funny line to walk because it's not a recognized movement, but it strikes me as what we're trying to do. I love, I really love that. And the branding is so important because it's galvanizing. Right. And I, I know every time I've used the word meta project, people are like, wait, Facebook, right. It's been uh, now it's been stolen. Right. So uh, I almost no. want to do like the movement toward a better verse, right. Or so get away from right. meta project. Cause it's from a branding perspective, it's, it's really not a good choice anymore, unfortunately. Um, and I, I agree with well, you too. I, I, I like, Oh, I'm sorry. You're trying to say something. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I appreciated the fact that from the start, you know, uh, Jordan bracketed Meta Project and, you know, as, as like he knew he was talking about something that wasn't really called that. Mm -hmm. He wasn't branding. And, you know, it is, it is going to be a challenge to figure out what the hashtag is that everybody is going to understand the way they understand Black Lives Matter or Me Too or, you know, whatever it is as, um, as, oh, we're all, we're all pushing this, you know, greater good agenda. Maybe it's hashtag greater good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unfortunately that comes with some other, some other term, you know, some other implications and inferences that I would steer away from, but sure. yes, yeah. your, your point, I think we're making this is similar, right? Is that a different name would be wise. <laughs> We're not just not quite sure what it would be. And before we get into really pushing this name out to a bunch of places, it probably would be wise to consider it again. And I did notice Jordan's point at one point, he was like a lot of money went into this name, um, which I didn't realize. Right. And um, so that or meta project, I thought meta project, but maybe I was wrong. If, if he meant, I think, it's I think he meant Lionsburg. Lionsburg. Oh, yeah. okay. Then, then I feel a little more strongly about maybe trying to change Meta Project because because of what we were just talking about. And I liked. I didn't know you were doing it tongue in cheek. I like the Lionsbridge Fund for Advancement of the Meta Project or Advancement of the Betterverse or Greater Good or whatever we want to call it or whatever ends up being called. Um, you know, I think is 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 actually nice because to me, I always, you know, to me the funding is one piece. It's not everything. Right. And so putting them together is is a little uncomfortable for me, I'll admit any, any more than I would say factor meta project, or, I mean, this is what we're talking about today, right. Or seriously yeah, meta project sure. or catalyst meta project. I, um, thanks Michael. I, I, I agree. Met, meta project is kind of like the environmental movement or meta movement or whatever. Um, and I'm not crazy about the name either. Um, I, I'm not sure that we're going to find a great name that's good for everything. 
um, my rule with names kind of is you you pick you pick a name that you can stick with and and like Amazon was never a good name for a bookstore or a, you know a dry goods store. Um, eBay was never a good name for an auction house. Um, you just pick a, a name that's distinctive and doesn't offend anybody too much, and then you keep double down, doubling down on what that means. And, and after a while, it, you know, it, sticks. it, it becomes obvious um, by, by a, a story, by the way, um, uh, the founder of LinkedIn was uh, an angel investor in my company, social text. And so he was talking about this new pro early, you know, early on, I have this new thing. It's going to be a network of all everybody's business contacts and stuff like that. And then it's going to be called LinkedIn. And I'm like, LinkedIn, that's the dumbest name. I cannot even imagine why you would name it that. And it sounds like link and tin together. And it's like, I was smart enough. Thankfully, I was smart enough not to say anything. I, I learned my lesson by complaining about names prior to that. So, mm -hmm. so now if you say LinkedIn, everybody knows like that, what it means, right? And I, I was totally wrong in guessing that it was a stupid name. Um, it's not necessarily a great name, but it has become genericized to the point where you know what LinkedIn is if you're in business and, you know, that's, that's the, that's what happened. Um, I, I don't, wouldn't mind meta. It's to me, it's more that it's, I have to keep making a caveat with, with, uh, Facebook now. That's the only, that's, that's the only, and that's, that's a, a good thing, bad thing. You know, it's a good news, bad news kind of thing. Um, uh, the, the people I've learned naming stuff from, uh, uh I, I worked with a brilliant, uh, marketing, uh, VP of marketing on another startup. Um, and we picked Yipes, uh, as, as a name for an internet company, an uh, internet, uh, infrastructure company, broadband company. And he's like, okay, Pete, here's the way it works. You pick something that like startles people and gets their attention. And then, then you've won a big chunk of the battle, um, for their, you know, attention and mind space. The, the work that you have to do is then to fill in, you know, the conversation after that, right? So I, I think my, my friend Ron might argue that Meta is actually a really good thing to choose, even though Facebook hijacked it because it, you know, it sticks in people's minds. Um, so the first conversation is, you know, oh, you guys are working with Facebook. And so then we say no. And then the next part of the conversation is, oh, you're the people that named yourself after Facebook what do you do again? You know, and, and it's a pretty good hook that way. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I just want to put voice to the, the um, comments <laughs> that Michael and Jonathan are putting in chat about, you know, making it nonsense names. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, what I've learned from people in my spheres, my personal spheres who are brand, you know, how brand experts are the just echoing that that's true, right? A nonsense word is better. You can make it mean something. Yep. But that's not, I mean, that's not <laughs> maybe also, getting off of um, flotilla here. Um, somebody um, came to my Civilization 2.0 site and said, hey, I don't want you to own the word Civilization 2.0. <laughs> so there's even that kind of friction. Yep. I, I, I wanted to come back to a point um, Brad, Brad has his hand up too, just pointing out. Um, yeah, hi guys. I'm I'm actually going to have to jump off at ten, um, and it's, I've been trying to just sort of monitor here, but been a little distracted. Um, as someone who's coming, who's fairly fresh to um, you know this whole conversation, um, yeah, that all makes sense. I mean, to me, Lionsburg is actually problematic, and I don't know if that's even at issue here, but. Um, that it just has the wrong ring to me um but anyway that's a that's a, uh that's just my two cents um for me meta project uh is is a little too generic for my purpose for what i although it is descriptive of what 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 it is so i mean i think there's a lot of value in that but anyway uh branding's always fun um but anyway i mainly was just going to say that I'll, I'll have to say goodbye in about 10 minutes Thanks, Brad. Um, I think I've got three different things now to talk about. Um, so one of them is, uh, if it's okay, I'll share my screen again and let me know if it's not. Um, one of them is 
the way I think of the non generic meta project sovereigns, um, we want to say if you're a, you know, hashtag the meta project capital sovereign, or maybe it's if you're a Lionsburg meta project sovereign, um, you're autonomous and you're, you're, uh, you're coordinating with other meta project sovereigns. And so that means that you communicate about your mission in your project. You're willing to be in directories. And that uh, you are able to make, uh, make uh, commitments and um, attempt to keep them. And Another another thing that you could add to this list um, is that you believe in the principles that Meta Project has, and I think that's one that we don't want to add counterintuitively. I agree with that. And Brad, did you um, have your hand up from before or something new? Sorry, I just forgot to lower it. My, my arm's getting tired. <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, so so the, the difference between, for me, the difference between Lionsburg, the Meta Project, and EDF or Sierra Club and Greenpeace and whatever um, is that we're trying to invent or instantiate, actually, for me, it's replicate nature um, by having sovereigns and having them be autonomous and having them coordinate um, and teaching people how that happens, um, and then having sovereigns that make commitments to each other, that whole structure is something that, that we believe is going to be able to bootstrap to be much bigger than the Sierra Club and much bigger than Greenpeace and much bigger than Black Lives Matter and much bigger than, and, and that this is, for me, this is the, the Lionsburg I guess there's maybe two parts of it. One, one part of Lionsburg for me is, Jordan's ability to keep saying the and we're all working towards the higher purpose, a higher goal together. You know, there's one project. It's not like we're, you know, a hundred projects or a thousand projects or a million projects. We're all working on one lowercase meta project. Um, and then the, the only way that you get that done is by having autonomous servants coordinating. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to um, to convey. Another thing is. We're, what we're starting to do is, is enumerate the things that we need to name. So there's a name for the overall movement. There's a name for the focusing group that um, says, these are the things that we need to work on together that are a part of the magic project. So this for me is kind of Lionsburg. And maybe another one is another thing that we need to name is the kind of sovereign that's working on. Um, and there's probably like six or eight of these. And so part of part of our challenge is when we're talking about Lionsburg or Meta Project or Sovereigns or something like that, we're we're actually trying to name a number of things. Um, and I think if we work to figure out what the things are that we're trying to name and differentiate them from each other, then we can name them more effectively. Can I just interject? The group that prioritizes, I would say, is part of the meta project, not part of Lionsburg? Um, I didn't say prioritize. Um, oh, publicize. I'm sorry, I'm reading small type. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, prioritization is a whole other interesting publicize. thing. Publicize. So what do you mean by identify then? Uh, like just recognize? This, or? this for me is... Um, uh, this for me is the mosaic and tiles thing that mm -hmm. that I have borrowed from Jerry and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have, have tried to give to Jordan and Jordan likes it and makes sense. So identifying, you know, so so one obvious tile is is helping people understand sovereigns and the way to coordinate the way sovereigns coordinate. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Another, there's a, a whole bunch of these, you know, the SDGs are kind of in this, uh, the SDGs form a imperfect mosaic and an imperfect set of tiles. Um, so there's a, a bunch of 
core things. So tapestry is also in here too, right? I don't know how, if I would put, I don't know if tapestry is lowercase, uppercase. I don't know. Yeah, either. Tapestry is um, uppercase, but that's fine. It's a concept. Uh, So even, you know, we, we've had trouble, or I don't know, trouble is not the right word, but, you know, there are things, things we're trying to figure out whether it goes in this bucket or whether it doesn't go in this bucket. So I've, I've kind of made the assertion that the directory of all the projects isn't part of this. It's actually sovereigns that work. That, so Lionsburg is going to say, okay, we have to have directories. Um, but Lionsburg shouldn't be the organization that, that creates the directories, right? It should say there's a need for directories and then um, Catalyst and whatever else comes into that. Um, so then uh, another thing I wanted to talk about was regenerative agriculture and Klaus. Um, is it okay if I go there? Yeah, no. Sorry, I'm still I'm still working on the this little cool. addition here. So we can stay here. I I don't want to whip whip sauce around. Yeah, I'm like there there needs to be a group that helps prior you know, again, I'm I'm coming from the assumption now that meta project is a little more is more about the process and the mortar between the tiles, right? So um, and that the the tiles will will surface. They either already exist and will become will will be interested in collaboration, or they will surface right and become become sovereigns and then get woven in, um, or glued down in the case of the mosaic right. And so there needs to be a group that helps prioritize what the collaborative effort will focus on. And I guess I'll use collaborative action just then to start repeating that. That's that's an open question for me. And there's a to to connect, publicize, and prioritize. Um, so by by my thinking, you can't you can't really prioritize autonomous sovereigns. They're going to pick their own priorities. Mm -hmm. So what you do <laughs> is you say that you, you can publicize the fact that social justice is more important than climate change or vice versa or whatever, right? You can, you can publicize here are the problems and here are the things that need fixing and here are the, the efforts we've identified that could help fix that. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, a, there's a, a kind of prioritization there, but it's a soft prioritization. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, it's talking about the need for it and comparing it with the other needs but not, I guess, I guess it, I, I want to caution us that prioritize is like a project management term that it's mm -hmm. like, okay, well, um, I have declared that we're going to do these things first and we're not going to do these, these other things, you know, until we get the first one done. Um, and I know that's not right. what you mean, but no, it's easy no, but it is sort that. of in there in that, right. Like even when we're talking about map weavers, we're talking about you know, we're now we're starting to talk about, okay, here are the projects towards achieving something, right? So the collaboration to a certain degree, I think everyone inside in the room, a sovereign and even between that, sovereigns, there's definitely going to be prioritization, right? Right. And what I'm saying is there is some collaborative effort, all the, you know, at the, at the between mm -hmm. and that there's sense making that needs to happen there right and I, so i mm -hmm. think your your term of soft prioritization is is good i i don't think just identifying it is enough 
and they do think it needs to go like one inch mm -hmm. more than that, right? And totally so agree. I'm not sure we have a word for that. Yeah. Right. Totally agree. Yep. Of like of just going, hey, everyone, we're noticing that if this comes first, it'll help a lot of other things, right? So yep. so even though that's not, hey, your sovereign's thing. We're just bringing attention to the fact that if this comes first, so if people are inclined, paying attention to this would be good, right? And then it happens or it doesn't happen. We can't make people the yep. same way that I'm proposing the regenerative agriculture thing comes out. Like I'm, I'm noticing that that is more ready for collaboration than maybe some other initiatives that are already working or in the works. And it therefore, it, I'm suggesting that it become a focus for a while as a way to experiment and also as a way to help someone do the work in their sovereign bubble that will help all of us in turn, right? It's one of those yep. more urgent ones um, and it's one of the more ready ones. So it rises to the surface, not puts it first to your point, right? Yep. So how do we yep. surface those things? And maybe that's a better way to say it, right? How do we surface the things that are ready now? There needs to be a group focused on that on the surfacing, on the seeing the whole of what all the sovereigns are doing, not who don't have necessarily a um, a bone to pick or a or a, that's the wrong way to say it, like a an attachment to that's a better way to say it, like an attachment to one particular sovereign when they're thinking about the collaborative and the the weaving and the mortar between everything. And we could put like suggested focus, like it's not. Yeah. A suggestion, not the. It's, that softens it already a bit. Um, and that's kind of why, to me, Lionsburg is a is separate from Meta Project, right? Because to yeah. me, Lionsburg comes has a role to play, uh, relative to the to the channeling. If I understand it right channeling of funding governance structures, right? The same way that other groups will have a role to play in the larger mosaic, right? I don't see nope. Lionsburg being the mosaic. I see Lionsburg being one tile. Yep. Um, I'm gonna talk about Klaus for, and, and then the I, ideas around uh, flow for collaborative action um, for a few minutes and then I'll, I'll uh, yield the floor. I want to hear about Vincent and Jonathan's work. Um, I wanted to uh, I wanted to note there was a beginning of a sovereign called Community Food Systems um, mm -hmm. that uh, Ann Penicus and I and Klaus a little bit worked on pretty hard um, for a, we put a lot of effort into it. Um, I put a lot of effort into it, and um, so did Anne. Um, uh, it it zombified um, back um, back probably in December, uh, and to go forward properly, um, we'd want to go backwards a little bit and talk about this. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I'm super, super interested in regenerative agriculture and soil health and stuff like that from a kind of a collaborative flow perspective, not, not so much a subject matter perspective. Uh, but this is one of the things that I identified along with everybody else that, and, and Klaus as a, as a lead in that. Um, and we, we put a lot of effort into it and it, and it stalled hard, um, mm -hmm. to the extent that um uh sam was you know one of the people working with us hard and he's like what the fuck guys you know i i'm i'm projecting mm -hmm. a little bit he's mm -hmm. like he said very nicely hey is there anything going on with this group and klaus <laughs> said you know hey there's stuff you know uh there's still energy but this group is quiet um so um so i want to talk more about that uh and then I think uh, kind of generically, um, uh, I'd like, Wendy, your, your focus on flow for collaborative action here and 
from my sovereign point of view, um, I, it's right that you don't want to put a bunch of resources on Klaus and say, okay, Klaus, figure out the, the way to connect all these resources and activate them. That's correct. I think what you do want is for there to be, I, I think you want to spin up a sovereign and then the sovereign wants to decide very proactively, very directive, very directly, here's the things that we're doing, right? Um, and so Klaus could be the leader of that sovereign or one of the leaders of that sovereign. Community food systems was set up so that Anne was the leader of the sovereign. And at least to my understanding, Anne was the leader of the sovereign and Klaus was the way I, I was thinking of it, Anne was the CEO or COO and Klaus was the CEO, um, the face of the sovereign and the, the person generating the drive and the effort and stuff like, or, or publicizing, mostly like making the effort happen. But Anne was really the driver of it. So I think without, I, I, the, the way that you get collaborative action is um, a, a sovereign with, a leadership, uh, leadership and focus driving um, the action. So unless you have that, unless you have a focus and a one or a group of people who've decided to lead the effort, you, nothing happens, right? You can contribute a lot of stuff. So, so the good news is we had that for community food systems um, in Anne, uh, and the bad news is it still didn't work for various reasons we could talk about some other time. Yeah, I'd love to talk about it. Um, just to respond to that. Yes, and I'm picturing it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, in my mind, um, I've already I've already made some assumptions that have not been talked about just so I can move forward in my own head. Yep. And one of those assumptions is that the sovereigns will organize themselves around the around sectors, right? Of, of either Meta's choosing or we pick a set or something like that, right? And part of the reason why I'm doing that in my own head is because we need a way to organize how people see themselves in, you know, in terms of the work kind of work they're doing. And this, you know, is the conversations about tapestry or about any sort of the mapping. There needs to be a way to congregate some things and slice and dice it in different ways to congregate things in different ways to see where the synergies are. I think when ass assuming we wave a magic wand and that happens, right, then people will see themselves in as being associated with particular areas, whether it's governance or it's, you know, arts or it's right. So again, waving a magic wand, let's assume people see themselves. Then when we're, when, when meta project says, Hey, we would like to help. We're, we're seeing the emergence of a need, both from a, timing perspective and also an interest perspective and a readiness perspective that regenerative agriculture could use some help, right? Let's say it says that. And from an initial meeting with Klaus and a couple other people in the field, we see that this request for guidance is needed. And we're putting out a request specific, could be to all the sectors or it could be to specific, we're putting out a request for guidance from the environment sector, the governance sector, the education sector, and the art sector. And we would like people who are willing and wanting to come forward from those sectors to have a conversation about it, right? And see what we can do to help support Klaus, right? So already they're choosing, but it's, it gives us a framework to ask for asking without, like it's really just those people in those sectors. So the sector itself doesn't have to be a sovereign because inside the sectors, there are already sovereigns or just interested people who don't have to make a sovereign in order to, to take part. Right. So people come together. Right. So it could be tons of individuals, too, who are just ready to mobilize on something or want to jump into another sovereign or want to just jump into this project because they're organized around a sector. They recognize themselves and can say, oh, here's where I can contribute. Now we're aimed towards something. They have a conversation and in amongst themselves, they can start proposing different things. And again, then it becomes meta to curate all of that help to create some sense out of it and do a proposal back to the community. This is what we're seeing. This is how we're seeing it work together. This is how we're seeing it help Klaus who's in, like who actually wants to take action now on these things. And you're gonna have some fall off and people right, pick up some pieces and then either it's enough 
to move something forward or it fall, you know, it falls apart there and it either, which would tell me it's not timing yet or, right? So to me, the structure that we're trying to create in the mapping is enough. I'm not sure that we need different sovereigns for that structure. However, the sovereigns themselves, either as individuals or as groups, need to then be the commit, you know, be a commitment. We may find at one point that meta itself has kind of like a, a organizing sovereign around environment that helps to coalesce just for environment. But right now I'm seeing it that we just need a, a collaborative effort around meta itself. But I could see that fractaling out as well. So that environment does the same thing. They have people coming that just have issues inside environment sector or whatever we want to name it, right? And then that they have their own kind of hub for that. And only does it, do they raise issues up when they need collaboration across all the sectors uh, up to the meta level. Um, and so in that sense, there's a little bit of hierarchy and there's, but there's most definitely the sovereigns. And, and that's why I think this process is just a little bit different than anything I've seen or experienced. Do you want to respond, Pete? Um, why don't you go first, Jonathan? Oh, OK. Um, Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, so flow was mentioned earlier. Uh, and it occurs to me that what the meta project can provide, in addition to everything we've been talking about, is identifying how Sovereign A is feeding their results to sovereign B. Um, and that, that isn't a hierarchy thing. That's an agreement, a negotiated agreement between sovereign A and B. And um, I'm drawing attention to the notion of identifying opportunities for doing that and matchmaking and um, stewarding a conversation that um, makes concrete a deliverable. Um, this is, this prevents or, or aids the process of, how do you say, um, collaboration as a whole, um, which I, I I think is is in the spirit of the capital M capital P um, request for guidance. Um, sovereigns have a tendency to work in isolation as a silo, and I think this is a good thing because focus is important. Uh, but um, knowing how my little silo piece fits into the bigger thing can often be very invigorating. I have a purpose. I, I'm doing this for Sovereign B and uh, I'm helping them in doing what I'm doing. So those are my two cents. Um, I. I, Wendy, I, I really liked your explanation. <laughs> and I'm not sure I completely agree. Um, uh, but I definitely want to keep the conversation going because I think it's super generative. Um, and I, 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 I don't know if we're saying the same thing in a different way or if we're saying different things. And, and I want to keep figuring it out. The um, I think you're describing a, one of the different patterns that that I think would work, where um, people people and sovereigns in sectors um, kind of get their attention brought to a a little bit more of a focused need, um, and and then maybe maybe in my language, and then we see if it can spin up a sovereign if there's enough energy to spin up a sovereign. The, um, I, I think that's a good pattern. And the pattern that I see, and another pattern that I see is, is the kind of the complement of that or the inverse of that, where um, a few people identify a need and, and start the sovereign 
um, and the sovereign spins up from those people rather than kind of spinning out of you know the collection of other sovereigns and 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 people um, you start with a very focused sovereign uh, for example uh, you might be talking to Klaus, um, and Klaus is talking about Bend, Oregon, and Southern California, and uh, this little farm that he knows in Aptos uh, near Santa Cruz. And you're going, ah, I've got family in Santa Cruz, um, and I know I know that area. Um, that farm in Aptos, what do you think they need? You know, and coming down to a really specific project that happens to be in a sector is the way that I see is, is, is the most powerful way that I've seen sovereigns to come into being. A few people get together about something that's very focused and they're super passionate about, and then they don't have everything they need to accomplish it. But, um, and, and that's when they reach out to the, you know, reach out to the environment, to the network and say, hey, um, we've got this focus and vision. Um, five years from now, this farm in Aptos is going to be, you know, we, we will have turned um, uh, contaminated soil into super rich and fertile soil. We'll be growing these kinds of vegetables, yada, yada. We've got, it, got the idea of what's going to happen. And it's very focused, right? Um, and yeah, sure, it's in the, the, it's in the sectors of regenerative health and, you know, um, food equity or whatever, but I don't really care about that. What I really care about is this project and making it happen, right? But I don't know how to market the thing. And, and hey, network, I need help marketing. Or hey, network, I need help funding, a common one. Or hey, network, it turns out that there's this mechanical thing that we think is super easy to do, but we have no way to figure out how to do it. Or we've, we've tried to you know, we've tried to do the mechanic, mechanical engineering of it and we've completely failed. Hey, network, can you help us with this pump system that we think is going to be the key to, you know, making life green again or whatever, right? So there's the, uh, the, the pattern you described, come, it seems like it comes from outside in kind of. And then another pattern is from right inside with one or two or three people talking about there should be, you know, and grows out from there. And the, I'm not, I, I wouldn't say that either one of them is better or worse. And I like both of them actually, but the one that has more focus and more autonomy and more drive, the, the thing that you want is um, probably most of us here have, have experienced that thing where you wake up in the morning and you go, thank God I've found this project or thank God I found the resources to do this project because this is the thing that I am most passionate in the world about and I'm just going to do this whether or not, you know, I would be doing this, you know, even I, I am doing this even though I'm not getting paid, right? Or, or I would, um, thank God I'm getting paid for this because this is the thing I would be doing, you know, you, you need that, you need that hyperdrive about a particular thing, right? Um, uh, for instance, for me, one of the things in my life is Massive Wiki, right? I wake up every day going, thank God Bill's helping me on Massive Wiki because I would, otherwise I would be doing it by myself. I'm going to be doing Massive Wiki for a while because it's the most important thing that I think is in the world, right? When I'm not doing other things. But, but anyway, you really need that drive and passion somehow. I guess, I guess you end up in the situation where I guess maybe where I'm coming to, and finally, thanks for listening to me while I was doing it. If you go outside in, you still end up needing a small group of people who are passionate about a project, a particular project, right? Um, and, and I apply that in different ways. Um, if Um, you can bootstrap your way into that, right? If, if you see that there's, yeah, I, I kind of can't explain what I'm thinking. Klaus is an interesting example of where um, uh, I got involved in community food systems, what ended up being called community food systems. That was a name that we came to after a whole naming exercise. I got involved in community, uh, community food systems because it was, meeting after meeting where Klaus would, would say these amazingly, you know, um, dramatic and intense things, you know, like 
food in, food is going to collapse in 20 or 30 years. You know, my great grand, my grandkids, my great grandkids are going to be starving. Right. And that's like galvanizing. Um, after, you know, the fourth or fifth or 10th time I heard Klaus say that um, uh, in calls, it was like, we need to get Klaus some help because, <laughs> you know, I'm not a food expert, but I've heard enough from Klaus to know that this needs to be done. Let's figure out how to hook up Klaus with the right stuff. Right. And so we spun together a sovereign that was focused on particular parts of operationalizing solutions to Klaus's observations that, you know, so it, it, until you get that crystallized few people who are going, this is the most important thing, I'm, I'm going to work on this, you know, full time um, for the next six months or the next three years or whatever, until it's, you know, until it's not, until enough other people's hair is on fire that I don't have to be the one pulling for it, right? That's, we, we need to get to that for every sovereign, basically. Yeah, my, my only, I agree with all of that. And so I just tried to capture it and hack and D. And I think Jonathan, it was you that was helping type in there too. Was that you? Yeah. Um, so we just tried to capture all of that. And, and I like how you phrased it too. It's like the outside in versus the inside out. It's kind of almost like top down versus bottom up, you know, a little bit too. A little, yeah. Um, and not in a bad way. No, no, in a beautiful way. I really like, I really like how we just kind of tease that apart in our conversation today, because I think that's really important to understand that both processes are happening and they're probably happening at the same time too. Yep. Um, and I don't want to lose one little thread that really hasn't come up and well, it, a little bit, it hasn't, I just want to kind of like really bring it to the fore, which is the individual, right? Not so much a group Right. And when we talk about spinning up sovereigns, I think that's really healthy for groups that are starting to work together around something, even if it's, you know, right at the seeds, you know, it sooner is better kind of if it really feels like it has momentum and, and it's really galvanizing. But there's so many opportunities for individuals to come in and go out of things and life yep. happens too, right? That, that making sure that whatever processes we're talking about allow for the individual in and out too, that we're not so focused on creating sovereigns all the time that we, or feel such a need to create a sovereign every time there's a little bit of, a little bit of momentum that the individuals are like, that's, I didn't mean that kind of commitment, <laughs> like they, they back off or they feel like that now there's a lot of friction to just getting to just doing a, a, a few things. Like we're just gonna go to the beach this weekend and clean up the garbage, right? Do we need a sovereign for that, right? So it's, it's that kind of thing to me. Now there might be a sovereign around that that's organizing beach cleaning for everything, or it could just be somebody who lives near the beach who wants to go pick up some, you know, and, and catches up with a few friends to do it. I wanna leave space for both. This, the, another, this is another super important conversation um, because so um, so one thing into that is that um, I, I'm pretty sure I've made it feel and other people have made it feel like sovereign is like a big grand thing, right? Um, an individual can be a sovereign and the, you know, and a sovereign is just saying, I'm going to commit. I guess a meta project sovereign for me is that ability to, or the ability to make a, a commitment, right? So the um, the the recordings uh, for the Meta Project Wednesday calls weren't being posted, and we needed to refer to them. And so, not only did I raise my hand and bug Jordan about it, but I I also kind of committed, at least to myself, you know, hey, I, at some point I said, hey, Jordan, if it's you know if you're too busy to do it, I'll do it, <laughs> and in in so doing, I, I didn't think in my mind, I'll do this one, but then I'm out of here. It was, I'll do this one and I'm going to keep doing it for a while, or at least until somebody else takes over. And thanks Vincent for, for helping take over or, or supplement. I'm going to keep doing it. Um, so when I say sovereign and this isn't clear yet, it's like, I'm going to do this and I actually have a little, a little bit of a commitment, right? Um, so I'm going to clean up the beach today and I'll also commit to myself at least to, to clean it up next September as well, right? Um, so not that sovereigns have to make that commitment, 
but a major project sovereign, you start to need to, to you know, um, I think the, the other thing, I, I'm a little bit torn about, we had a, we had a situation recently where an individual just wanted to help out um, and and Meta Project failed them because it didn't Meta Project didn't make it obvious, you know, how to structure the help, how to reach out to others to see if that help was needed or if it was another kind of help or what, right? Um, and in reflecting on that failure, the one of the things to me is, and I kind of said this on the Wednesday call. Um, we, we have a, and maybe it's our culture, we have a problem where it's really easy for people to get into their own head um, and, and get super far in investing time and energy into an idea without reaching out for some triangulation with other people. Um, uh, so I, I hear, I have my friend, Bill, who's, who's like, hey, but what about me? I don't, I don't want to be a sovereign. <laughs> I just want to help and I want to help where it's helpful um, and I want to know how to help. Um, so I, I get that. There's a, a danger to me of the, a solution which I don't like completely, but a solution that, that I think addresses some of the concerns that I saw for unaffiliated individuals being tempted to be in their own head too much and do too much work that isn't helpful to the network. A solution that I thought of is, hey, if, if you're an unaffiliated person, I think the sovereignty and the federation or the, the sovereigns and federation thing is so important for people to learn. It's like, if you're not part of a sovereign, maybe what you should do is join up with a couple other people to be a sovereign. And then that sovereign should be the thing that looks for where I can plug in, right? So if I'm called to, to clean up the beach this weekend, maybe what you should do is instead of just doing it yourself, um, talk to at least a couple other people and say, hey, can we make this a bigger effort than just me going to the beach, right? Um, would you go with me? Um, is it a good idea? Which beach should we go to? So getting that out of one person's head and into two or three people's heads, um, uh, I think is a good thing. And I'm not saying that we should never have individuals, but I think it's so important for the network for people to learn to reach out to others um, and to start learning that you know, we're a sovereign and we've decided what to do and you can't tell us what not to do or do what to do. Um, but together, we've also got a governance process where we decide which beach to go to and whether it's this weekend or next weekend. And, and hopefully one of us would say, hey, not only maybe we could also write a blog post about it and, and you know, or maybe we can take pictures when we're at the beach and put those in a blog post. And maybe we can get a, a movement going around cleaning up the beach rather than just, I went to the beach, I cleaned stuff up, it was great. Which I don't, I, I, I want to make sure that that's an okay thing to do, but it, it really helps be build the meta project when we think of other people, when we start to coalesce. So I want to make sure that we don't, I guess, you know, I, I, I definitely want to make sure there's balance. But I also want to weight the balance. I guess I want to tip the balance a little bit towards, yeah, you know, let's let's think about that. Let's let's put a pod together to do that. We don't have to call it a sovereign. Let's put uh, you know, but but teaching people the patterns of that and and encouraging that and weighting that a little bit heavier than you know, just a drive by a drive by help is great, um, but you know, think about doing it a, a little bit more in a in a in a collaboration pattern, in a maybe a collaboration flow to steal your or to borrow your your phrasing. Thanks for really letting me rant that out. <laughs> Am 
Michael, you're up in the queue. I'll take another shot. Talk to you. Not so well. Not so well. Uh, uh, let me see if I can turn anything else off. Uh, how about that? Better? No. No. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, well, okay. I'll we'll we'll go to Wendy and, and see. Yeah. Uh, he's going to bail and come back. Um, yes, and I guess <laughs> what this <laughs> because I, I, um, I, I really want to advocate for the unseen here, right? It's mm -hmm. the, there's already so much friction, I think, for a lot of people in contributing even an hour of their time to something. Mm -hmm that making to me that the emphasis is should be on making that as easy as possible mm -hmm. and to create what you're suggesting which is beautiful and necessary and important i think my experience with that is it comes from the modeling of that from the top down and yep. sh and and right this what we're talking about like making the process seem easy right once it once it becomes a thing that just everyone oh i we just get what this is which will take some time then it won't even be a question. And I think there will always be the very introverted or very busy people who just, the fact that they did it on their own at all is a, is a win, right? Yep. And then there'll be the, which you can't, you just the mere mention that they have to coordinate with one other person, person is enough friction in their mind to like not have it happen, <laughs> right? Yep. To people who with just a tiny bit of encouragement be like, oh my God, that's a good idea and excited to invite 10 more people to come with them, right? So there's, and I think that just, there's so much in there in terms of per people's personality, you know, what the community li they live in, whether they feel connected to those people, whether they are that kind of, whether they're more extroverted, whether they like organizing, whether they're, you know, whatever, that for some people that's super easy and the mere mention of it is exciting and the other, for other people that is such a hurdle for whatever's going on in their lives. And so both, and I, I personally think there's a bunch of right now, the way things are right now, there's a bunch of potential built up in, in individuals who, who haven't figured out a way yet to collaborate with each other, but are happy to do something, even if it's just something in their home, right? That could contribute to the overall picture. And Klaus and I were talking about that yesterday. So most of what his idea is trying to reach people at a very, you know, very basic level, not trying to overwhelm them with all the details about the microbiome, but letting them know that if they just did this one thing, it could really help. Like if everyone just did this one, right. And so some of that comes from top down of like, everyone should create a victory garden because then that creates, you know, 40% of the food production he's quoted, you know, came from victory gardens during the war. Um, but it, you know, and while we don't have that top down kind of emphasis right now, I think there are plenty of people, me included, who be like, I'm happy to do one more thing. You, you got to tell me what that one more thing is. I'm not sure what it is. You know, if I'm going to redo my kitchen, how, how can I do that in a way that is more sustainable? Trying to find that information is very hard. So just getting my information to me or, you know, what are the distribution channels for that, right? Information alone can, can, can do a lot for, for the individual, could galvanize a lot, create more movement just on the individual level without the need for even figuring out what the collaborative or encouraging more collaboration. So. Um, yes. Um, uh, just to mention, Wendy Elford has, has suggested, um, to me at least, uh, that a combination of one more thing and helping us connect instead of just virtually also a little bit physically is to do one more thing, one more very small thing together. Um, so let's let's all find a seed and plant a seed, and then you know we can talk about how it's growing or not growing um, over time, right? And she's she sees that as a way of essentially you know creating a pattern in everybody's head, and then throughout the day that you're participating in this global pattern of all doing a thing together um, uh, and connecting, right? To me, it's like connecting to that bigger story is just as important as connecting to an a, another person in that moment. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I hear the concept crowdsourcing and what you guys are talking about. Yeah. Uh, with the added emphasis on sharing the experience as well as the action, which to your word, uh, Pete, galvanizes. Um, you know, Victory Garden, we're all doing this together. Um, and my brother likes the idea of showing the impact, you know, okay, you've all done this. And here's what that created or the possibility that's emerging sort of like that. Um, so I see multiple phases in what you guys yep. are talking about. Uh, I, at the risk of um, putting a period at the end of this sentence, I wanted to request opinions on we're, we're an, a, a different name that's captured my attention, which is the word sovereign. And um, I hear the word group uh, used where the word sovereign probably fits just fine. Um, and, you know, of course, I, I like the word guild, uh, but I, you know, I don't have to force that. Um, but I'm noticing that um, it might be, there's a, there's a possibility that by deciding that sovereign equals pod equals group equals organization equals project equals guild might be um, useful so that when we see any of these words, we know they mean the same thing. Um, because otherwise, they'll mean different things. And I'm not sure that um, having them mean different things is, I think it might be divisive and make us think, uh, I'm doing a group and you're doing a sovereign and we can't expect the same things from each other. I, I, I like that idea. And I, I want to observe that there are different things to name. Um, so one of them, what I've been calling a sovereign is, is also what I call a, a sovereign in the OGM sense or a sovereign in the meta project sense, which um, with, without, without any qualification, sovereign just means you're autonomous and you have um, authority, absolute authority over, your, over something actually. Um, sovereign in the OGM meta project sense for me means that you're willing to be in a directory and talk about what you're doing and um, you have the ability to make commitments um, and, then, and that you'll try to keep them. So that's different. So then a group to me, I, or another thing to name, I guess maybe so I, I can work backwards from the names that we've got to the, the things that we need to name that are different. Um, a group is just a, pe a, a set of people, right? Um, um, it, it may not have focus. Uh, it probably doesn't, isn't able to make commitments um, affirmatively. Um, uh, and then for me, a guild is, is different. Um, a guild is, could be a sovereign, could be a group, um, uh, but a guild is doing some internal, um, it's, it's more like a community of practice where it's doing, doing some internal um, teaching and, and mentoring about a practice, right? So a sovereign doesn't have to do that um, ah. to be effective. Um, a guild probably has governance and a sovereign has governance, but they probably tend to have different governance structures. So there's there are different things to name and we need to figure out how to be clear about naming them differently. And, and then I, I also agree that when you're talking about one specific thing, you, you kind of want to use, you want to coalesce around you know, a, a single 
phrase or word or whatever that's going to continue to mean the same thing to people rather than you know okay i think what you know I, I think we're doing the same thing and and yet you're calling it something different and then when we go into a meeting together you say one thing i'd say another thing and then everybody's confused so that's definitely a thing and another thing actually is also that as we scale and especially as we start to hit different cultures and different languages um uh we're gonna have to be flexible about you know, flexible and, and fast about kind of negotiating, okay, what are you guys talking about? What are we talking about? We've been using this different language, you know, should we continue to use the two terms, even though they, you know, mean the same thing? Should we coalesce onto one term in a different language? You know, all that kind of stuff. It reminds me a little bit of Marianne, um, Marianne on the Wednesday call talked about, um, uh, you know, oh, we're going to have a trust manifesto, maybe, right? And I'm like, well, maybe we're going to have three or six trust manifestos. And depending on which language and culture and history that you've got, you would say, yeah, I believe in this trust manifesto. And that one I can't agree with because it's got, you know, some component that makes sense in your world, doesn't make sense in my world. So there's going to be kind of a, you know, continuing negotiation of how we name things and what we're naming. And so I guess maybe the the root of all of that is it's really important to be clear about the different things that you're trying to name that you're probably when people are using different words sometimes they're using it for the same thing sometimes they're using it for different things and you have to back um reverse engineer what the things are that you're naming and then make sure that everybody's clear on you know when i say this i mean you know this particular thing the, the speed of um interaction mistakes can be made when one person just uses the wrong, uses a word that doesn't match what I would interpret that word to mean. So we'll, and, we'll have to have a practice and we'll have to get better at, a, at, at, at saying, hey, wait, um, I think let's, let's talk about what we mean here real quick and, mm -hmm. and kind of negotiate that meaning instead yeah. of letting it, the moment go past and confuse everybody. And so as to that, um there's this baton passing thing that allows one person to talk until they're complete and in the middle of that i might want to inject hey let's talk about what you mean by that word and that's not really possible in a baton passing protocol that we have so uh that's been an important question in my mind for quite a while now uh, what's the polite way to do that the baton passing protocol doesn't allow for that kind of injection can you be brilliant pete <laughs> tell me the answer <laughs> Um, I, it's, it's a longer discussion, right? I, I think, um, the, we're, we're doing a pretty good job today, um, uh, of kind of, I, you know, so you and I are having a conversation when Michael's hand has been up for a while. Um, uh, and, you know, I want to hear about the progress that you and Vincent have made on, you know, and et cetera. So we're, we're doing a pretty good job of kind of moving along, I think. I also feel like I took more floor time than I feel like I'm comfortable with. But, um, but then, you know, kind of separately, uh, Wendy did, um, uh, Wendy did a, a great job with, uh, I think it was one of the recent mapping calls. Um, uh, both having a queue and then not going ahead in the queue until she closed enough loops that everybody was complete and then moved on. And she was doing a thing where as the moderator facilitator, she was reflecting back, you know, the, where we were in the conversation. And so that was a case in which it was really a beautiful and wonderful thing to have 
a moderator who is both willing to kind of let the conversation happen, but also holding space and closing loops enough so that we didn't all feel, you know, completely disrupted. So we haven't been doing that on this call and it's better in some ways for it and, and a lot worse in other ways for it. And I also would recognize that when Wendy was doing that facilitation and holding space, it took a lot of time and energy away from her ability to think about what she wanted to say in the conversation because she was making sure to honor the, the conversation for everybody else. So there's a whole bunch of stuff wound up in there um, that we could talk about forever. It, it makes me think of the uh, group, works, uh, group works pattern language, actually. Um, a, a, a group of um, group facilitation people got together um, and wrote down different patterns of group facilitation so that they could have kind of a library. It's actually a card deck so that they could have a, a way of both communicating the craft that they were doing and also having being able to reflect on the different kinds of process facilitation that they could employ in the moment. Um, uh, it's, so it was a way of externalizing some of their uh, ability to do um, group process, both for themselves and for other people. It's a beautiful and wonderful thing, and we should do more of that. Um, so I just we just went through a couple of different ways that you can facilitate a meeting like this, and they're different and beautiful and wonderful in different ways. If we capture that in a pattern language, and by the way, a pattern language is not just a you know it's a, a highly constructed thing. So um, I'm sad when people do, do call things pattern language when they're not the Alexander style pattern language. But anyway. We should do that. So that's kind of all of that happened in the few seconds. All of that happened in my head in the, the few seconds that you were talking about baton passing and and when to pass when the baton gets passed, when it doesn't, how to pass it. Maybe it's Vincent's turn. Yeah. So I wanted to just I guess comment on the. That I mean, this conversation has been mainly about naming first with the meta project, but then it kind of went into naming of the different types of entities and connecting to what I was going to share. Because uh, I've had that in like the background of my head. I'm wondering if the if a group and a sovereign are basically the same thing, even though they have differences. Um, in the same way that like we all have difference, but we're all humans, like um, there's when it comes to differentiation of things, um, it's like, okay, are you mainly the same thing, but a different like subtype, like we're different instances of humans, but we're all humans. Um, are sovereigns and guilds all just different instances, they're unique and different, but they're instances of groups. And, and if the relationships between a sovereign and its members and a group and its members and its and a guild and its members are like mostly the same, not like the quality of the relationship, but the fact that they have members, then I wonder if that alludes to the fact that they are actually the same class of thing and that there just might be different instances of it. Um, not to say that there is like a main name, but that they're mostly similar enough to the point where they can be interchanged with, depending on the context. I I like um, I I like your hypothesis um, that things are the same if the relationships are the same. The um, there's deep water there about instances and classes of things. Um, so group to me is a big class of things mostly and guilds and um, sovereigns are, are, are more. So, um, so a group is kind of like saying a vehicle and um, a sovereign is kind of like saying a truck and um, right. a group is like saying a bus. So you can say that they're both vehicles, but if you need a truck and you got a bus, then you're gonna be sad and vice versa. Um, so there's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff to kind of watch out for there in, in, in saying that, you know, they're, oh, they're close enough for, for jazz, you know, 
you could use a bus to drive to the grocery store and you could use a truck to drive to the grocery store. But if you need, uh, you know, uh, 20 hay bales or if you need 16 kids, you, you definitely want one kind of group and not the other kind of group. Yeah, I, the, other, the other thing I was looking at, which is almost the opposite of this, I was uh, watching this um, video on how to build semantic search systems um, by uh, Lucidworks. And there was an um, assertion that they made that every instance of a word or a phrase you ever encounter has a unique meaning. So anytime you see the word sovereign, mentioned in a conversation or on a page on a text it has a slightly different meaning than every other time you've seen it even though it's the same word because of the the different layers of context behind it that's a that's a thing that wendy elford will say also she said it to me a number of times so when I say sovereign and somebody else says sovereign, and not just when I say sovereign, it means a different thing each time. And then, you know, the difference between the way I say it and somebody else says it, it's like. And then there's the game B notion of don't expect everybody to articulate things perfectly. So, yeah. you know, yeah. <clears throat> somebody's going to use a word and it's, I think it's on me to guess what they're really trying to say. Uh, that's a cognitive load. I mean, Wendy talks about, let's make this as frictionless as possible. Uh, well, I don't think we're ever going to get rid of the cognitive load of guessing there's, accurately. There's, there's approaches to it, though. I, the, the, it, 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 when somebody says something, then what you want to do is enter in a, into a conversation about, oh, what do you mean? You know, let's talk about that. And, and yeah. then there are ways to make that conversation more palatable or less palatable, right? Um, a less palatable way is like, okay, well, I wrote up a wiki page on this. Just go read that and you'll know what I mean. So that's a, a really brusque way to do it and, and a high friction way to do it, right? Yeah. Um, or or the, the worst one is, Okay, I think I, I assume that coming into this conversation, you already read that wiki page, and I don't know why you didn't, and I don't know why you're, you're saying that word. So that's the really bad ways to do it. The other ways to do it is like, oh, tell me about, you know, tell me about what, um, you know, tell me about your experiences, tell me about your context. That's All so right. cool, you know, and then you get off into context that may not matter to the main conversation, but helps yes. people be human together. And so, yeah. And I did that yesterday with Lisa Ma. She used the word sacred, and, and I, I heard fingernails on the blackboard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I admitted that to her, and mm -hmm. we had a very quick um, merging of her perspective with mine. Yeah. And it was, it was cordial, gentle, quick enlightening and sweet it, it was just exactly what you said so i get you and i agree and i think if people uh if conversations are open to that kind of seg of tangent taken to how do you say merge world views and then come back to the conversation it's pretty pretty enjoyable and 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 not at all friction you know, yeah the opposite of friction so like yeah fun so yeah, yeah i concur fun and human and human and it creates a deeper relationship yep which is cool so i'm hoping to hear what uh, you and vincent have been working on data type directories. Yeah, so I can I can share. Jonathan hasn't even seen this part of it yet, but because of him, I've been able to do this. <laughs> so I shared last week um, this explore data types page on Catalyst, which has a, like a very simple and sort of graphical representation 
for pictorial representation for each main data type. Uh, so the idea is that these are all like distinct um, data types that if you were designing a relational da database, you could kind of pick which ones you're going to use and that, and then be able to um, then have a schema for each one of these data types where you can interoperate with anyone else who is like, oh yeah, we're both using the languages schema. So like if we're going to both use languages in our application, then we should have some sort of similar way of representing languages in a way that we can, um, you know, have someone who speaks one language on one app, transfer their data to another app, and then it shows that they're speaking the same language. Um, and so basically, as I've been um, doing research in the last like three, four years over the different types of social networks that have been out there, I've kind of been keeping a, a tally of like any time I find a new data type that I feel like doesn't fit into one of these, I will add it to this list. And so this has kind of become like the synthesis of the like high level schemas that most social networks or matchmaking platforms or directories have um, or the way that people will use tools like Airtable or Google Sheets um, to kind of represent certain types of data um, more so with Airtable where each table is like kind of a unique tab um, in the same way that if you were to like you know have preset options for like long text attachment checkbox when creating a um, a new column. Um, what if when you if you created a new tab, you kind of picked through a drop down list of like, hey, is it one of these? Because if so, we can either automatically populate this for you with information like, oh, is this a language database? Well, here's all the languages. Um, or it could infer some things like, okay, this is a list of um, links. You probably want a URL field by default. And so um, then what that led me to start doing was to create um, a, a, a directory of the data type relationships, because I think this is, to be able to actually see how these are used, it's really helpful to see the relationships. So I made this where you can say, okay, um, platforms have servers, for example, um, you know, like Discord is a platform that has different Discord servers. And then those servers have channels and channels have messages. And this is a relationship that scales across like Mattermost, Slack, Telegram, Discord, like any type of chat platform will have this structure. And so that went into this relationship um, diagram. And I have right now, nothing is, there are no connections being showed, but you can toggle on and off the relationship types. So one that I did was can be. So there was a lot of people that are always asking me, like, what's the difference between a project and a group? And I'm like, well, these are all the things that can be other things at the same time. So like a project can be a group and it also could be a resource. Um, a group could be an organization um, and it can also be like you can share a post about a group. Um, but these are still distinct things in the way that I see they each have different like functions and they have differences between them. Um, so there's this other tab that I started working on during this call, which is just like differs from. So like, what if you wanted to see what were the differences between these things? Um, and so like, you know, groups are different because they are about people involved, not about the output of something. Uh, and then the have shows the relation, the kind of hierarchical relationship between these different things. So for example, if you were to hover over groups, you can see that groups have users. Um, the gray is a relationship type between two types. So for example, a user group is like, would hold information like when you joined a specific group, what your role is in a specific group. So that would be a data type that is a relationship type um, and group relationship is you know between two groups is a group relationship which would also have like the relationship between the groups um so yeah this is basically and then i have differ from connect serve take action on uh and so this is kind of a graph of at least catalyst or the different data types in catalyst and how they 
connect. And I would, I would say that the, the next layer to have on top of this could be um, another dimension could be um, the platform. So like if you took factor, then you could have a different set of relationships between these data types on factor, for example. Um, and so this could be like a template that could be applied towards different platforms that have schemas, but then you could also overlay those on top of each other and then see which ones have like matching shapes and matching um, patterns, like the connections between shapes, which would be like, oh, look, inherently open impact and catalyst could interoperate entirely as is with their projects schema because projects have tasks, tasks um, can be opportunities. And this is this is like the same structure. So kind of like the way that in a cell, your DNA will have like a, like a protein will have like a protein receptor and if they match it binds. Um, I'm wondering if like these are could be like proteins and then different platforms could input different data sets like connected data sets if they have a certain uh, matching structure. Very cool. That's really cool. Great job, guys. That's fun. I can see that being the work that you're doing to map all that out. I can see it being echoed in a lot of different, a lot of different ways, right? The way I'm, I didn't realize Kumo could do that, right? At the bottom, pick the different tabs, and then it it shows different relationships. I think that's really fun. Like immediately makes makes me think about map weavers and you know all the different ways that we could show how projects are related to each other and how initiatives are related to each other and how people are related to each other. That's really fun. Yeah, I guess my, my question is, uh, are there any relationship types or um, like other layers that are missing for the, on this that would be helpful for other platforms? Like that's the kind of question I'm asking now is like what, um, what other layers should there be on top of this visualization to help people actually be able to um, get more, more use out of it. Can you show it again? I'd have um, to look at it with that in mind. Um, how about uh, needed by? Oh, I was muted. So Jonathan, you're saying like, um, could you give an example? Um, not sure it pertains to this one because this is data types, but projects. Uh, project A could be needed by project B. So I may be speaking out of context. So that would be like an instance of a project needs another project? Correct. Um, it might apply here, uh, but I think it's, I'm trying to bang a square peg into a round hole, trying to apply it to your, to the data types Kumu diagram or data types. I don't think data types need other data types. Yeah, I can think of or, one. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. You know how Vincent, when we were doing tapestry, we were looking at, we hadn't gotten to this point yet of showing the strength of relationship between two mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that might be a nice one. Like, I don't know whether that would be nested inside of every kind of relationship oh. you're creating, but you know, how strongly things are related to each other, especially when we start. And again, maybe data types isn't, isn't the good, a good, necessarily a good relation, you know, good application for that. But definitely when we're talking about projects or people, right? The first thing I want to understand is, you know, is this person the leader of this group? Is this person just a member? Did they just hear about it? Like the getting at that kinds of um, relationship is, becomes key very, very quickly because otherwise it helps to pull the nest, the, you know, the, the, the nest of data apart and bring high, you know, highlight things. Um, right. I love it. I, I think Kumu would need some altering so that it could show waiting. I think, there... it can. I think it can show waiting actually. 
Oh. Yeah, I think the connection weight, you can have a, a width of the line thickness, which right. is correlated with the, the weight. My question would be, what would determine the weight? Like, like so users having contributions or users having skills, would the weight be the number of platforms in which there's a relationship between users and contributions or users and uh, um, you know, groups, or would it be the, um, yeah, like one, it could be the frequency that both of those data types exist out of a sample size of platforms. Um, my answer is, uh, let's have a long discussion about that. <laughs> yeah, it, it almost like each each view, right? You're doing data types. I'm I again going to, going back to our experience of doing the tapestry, where each kind of response, right? Whether it was expertise or whether some of them required different definitions of the strength, and some of them seemed to group. Like when we got down to the resources, it it seemed to repeat itself over and over and over. It didn't really matter the type of resource. It was either a suggestion, or I'd used it, or I owned it. Or I was right, like there were a couple, I've, I've forgotten exactly the wording I came to, but right, there was a set of four or five. And then you had even gone, well, we could just use strength as like one, one through five, right? Like we could, inter from, from, a, from a data standpoint, having some consistency around, you know, there's not a forever, um, there's not a limit, unlimited number of <laughs> types of strengths, you know what I mean? And, and you bring it down to like four or five and it starts to help to, so I would use that same principle here, right? But what would determine the strength, the, the degree of strength, I think determine, you know, is, is, should be determined by the, I mean, you guys would be the best to discuss that because I don't understand the interrelationship between data types as well, right? But I bet there would be some patterns there. Yeah, and like- I also, I also think that, you know, throwing a few numbers or a few weights and then doing a Kumu diagram and seeing if that really helps. And if yeah, it do does- Do an experiment with it first before you put a bunch of time into it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just sort of get a feel for it from looking at what Kumu presents to you. And you know, it could be helpful or it could be not at all helpful. Yeah, and then you could do interesting things too, like snap to snap to a circular grid, the things that have stronger weight so that they bring right. it closer. Oh, or, you know. right, or only show those things whose connections have high weight. Yeah. Weight greater than three. Because then it helps again, pull the nest apart a little bit and help to see right. the gems inside. Oh, and it shows kind of, if, if you only show high weighting stuff, that shows you the first order of um, sense making. And then you can lower the weight and get, you know, move towards overwhelm. Yeah, you I think. Choose how much you, <laughs> ideally, you'd get to choose how much you want, how much overwhelm you want, can handle. I think the more important question is defining what the weighting means, because another weighting, which is completely different that I just thought of is um, looking at like within one platform, like within Catalyst, um, looking at the, like, for example, the number of users that have contributions compared to the number of users that have projects, then that, that will show how, how often the information is filled out. Um, and that could show like where people are actually spending their time, which that's another way to represent the data, which it could mean that the interface hasn't been designed or isn't, it's a bad UI and people aren't filling out a certain data type because they don't, they can't figure out how, or it could be because that's a, something that people feel that is more important to fill out. So there's bias there. And um, it would, I think it would, yeah, I think, figuring out what you would actually want that weighting to show. And then even then it would probably be biased in some way. Um, I think that would be the, the most important question to ask before even um, figuring out how to visualize or how to um, interact with it. So you've identified that there are different kinds of weighting 
and each one has um, a, a, a corruptibility via a bias. Well, yeah, because the weighting is, it's we're kind of making a model, right? It's this is a, like a a model of data types, and yeah, so your sample size is going to affect the weighting. And if your sample size is one platform, then there's other factors that affect the the weighting that are even more pronounced based off of the design of that one platform. So it seems to me that the Oh, bye, Wendy. Uh, it seems to me that um, the question mutates into what good will waiting do any particular viewer? Yeah, and, and my intention for creating this is the audience or the viewer would be someone who either has a platform or is developing a, a schema to collect data. And so for example, like I just created an air table and I'm about to collect, create a map of people and projects. And I want to be able to reference a, a schema to see how other people set up the relationships between these different data types or the different tabs in an air table. Uh, so that is the context in which I think this visualization would be helpful and useful. Hmm. I'm having trouble parsing that. Um. So the easiest way for me to, um, I guess, it's kind of doing the reverse of what the Airtable base schema does. So um, if you create an Airtable, you can add this app called base schema here, and it will show you the different tables and then how they're related. So the tables and the fields. So like within data types, there's a um, data type relationship, and that is, you know, data type relationships has a relationship, two relationships to the data type, a from and a to. And so this is kind of the reverse. It's like looking at the, the schema and then saying, okay, this is like the schema here. Um, we're only interested in users, um, but if we wanna add like, oh, these are some other tabs that we can add to our Airtable to collect data and then these are like standard relationship types between these um, between these data types, which would make it so that when we create this air table, it's going to be interoperable with um, the catalyst data schema and any other air table that uses this protocol. Uh, okay. I, I also like that um, the way you clicked on user, it just, grayed out most of the other bubbles and retained the um, coloring of just a few. And what that spoke to me is that uh, seeing all the data types, it's like, oh my God, what the hell? But seeing just a few and how they relate uh, gives me a sense of focus that Wendy's waiting would also do uh, and maybe isn't as necessary as I think. So yeah, it, it could, the idea of waiting could go forward or not, I don't care. You're doing really cool stuff, Vincent, and, and I'd probably some of it is, is new and different. Um, I think you might want to look at upper ontology. There's a Wikipedia article about upper ontologies and read about those. And then um, ontologyportal.org is uh, the sumo upper ontology. Um, and then that guy wrote a book. Are there, um, is there a particular context with ontologyportal.org or is this like all of the internet? Ontologyportal.org is, uh, 
there's so there's a set of upper ontologies. Upper ontologies are basically um, just like schemas for ontologies, more or less. So then um, ontologyportal.org is a particular one called Suggested Upper Merged Ontology, um, which has a couple of good qualities compared to other upper ontologies. Uh, one of them is that it's uh, open and, and uh, free as opposed to like psych um, is maybe the oldest kind of ontology and upper ontology and it's not free and not open. But some of the lessons about how to, so how to construct an upper ontology, it, you're, you're like, you're in that space kind of, and they're probably a bunch of, you know, a bunch of things like, you know, waiting, how do you do that? Um, how do you order things? How do you structure things? You know, how do you, how do you generalize? How do you, that kind of stuff. It's, there's probably a fair bit of, um, a uh, fair bit of like thought about it, um, even though a lot of it's kind of ma ma mathematical more than more than you'd want. Um, there might be good stuff that you might find inspirational or useful. Yeah, thanks for sharing this. Um, it yeah it gives me some other words to use to describe. So yeah. is is what I shared a type of merged ontology? I I think it's I. I this is way out of my expertise. I think it's it's pretty close to an upper ontology. Okay. And upper ontology means that hey, if you've got a bunch of different schemas, let's make a meta schema so that we can, you know, all talk together. Okay. Yeah, and I I I'm sure this is with a lot of these upper schemas, they're context specific, right? Like it's a upper schema for the medical diagnostic industry. It's, right. it's actually the, the, the good ones and Sumo, for instance, um, uh, they have Sumo itself, and then they have different ontologies for communications, countries and regions, distributed communica uh, community, user interfaces, economy, et cetera, et cetera, geography, people, uh, emotions, <laughs> physical <laughs> elements, uh, viruses, weather, um, another cool thing about uh, Sumo in particular is it maps to WordNet. Uh, so WordNet is a semantically related uh, network of lots of English words. So WordNet is kind of a, a practical thing, you know, because it's got all the, you know, all the common words. And then if that's mapped into Sumo, I've, I've never seen that before, but um, you could it, it would make sumo more more accessible i think because you could look up a word in wordnet and see that it's related to you know i clicked this on the sumo and it's mm -hmm. so it's is it seems like it starts with entity or the, maybe the most the, yeah the most general thing but then it goes down really quickly into useful things you know, like coloring or. Right. It's interesting because the things at the edge of this are very specific. Two dimensional angle, contest attribute. Yep. Alethic attribute. I think these need definitions. <laughs> this is really cool though. Um, Yeah, this wonder, feels this feels very comprehensive in like uh, the realm of like representing information in yep. different ways. Yeah, and and being able to do that thing you were talking about, where you can map you know one thing to another thing if you've got the relationships kind of set up correctly. Yeah. Hmm. Interestingly, I noticed it's a one dimension, one directional graph. Yeah, higher hierarchy. Yeah. yeah.
I had to look up alethic because I didn't believe it was a word. Well, I mean, I, I, but did they misspell athletic or something? So mm -hmm. alethic refers to the various modalities of truth, such as necessity, possibility, or impossibility. <laughs> like, okay, somebody need a word for that. <laughs> Interesting. Well, every it time interesting to impose a filter that only showed 10th grade words yep the standard public discourse uh suggests oh, not using anything past 10th grade vocabulary to reach the greatest audience um, there's another cool thing called basic English, uh, which has 100, 100, 850 words. Wow. And there's an actual Wikipedia where it's all basic English. Huh, that's cool. It's a good way to learn a language. Yeah. You memorize those 850 words. I guess it's simple English. They, they went a little bit farther. I think they probably use a thousand words or something like that. So the interesting thing that I keep running into when it comes to, so um, like I'm super interested in this page you sent me, Pete, um, and, and then I'll be like, oh, okay, mapping to all of WordNet, so I'll click here, and then I get to a GitHub, and I'm just like, this is the most unhelpful way of communicating yep. information, yep. and I almost feel like an inherent um like out of principle i'm not going to engage with it because like you yep. have to do better than this like a list of like file names that say like read me relations there's like nothing you would yep. know is inside until you opened it and yep. there's no like visual hierarchy and then it just says like <laughs> yep <laughs> like it says yeah. added rules for kills like <clears throat> that helpful to me at all like i don't even know what this is yep. um like, is there something I'm missing in terms of like, is there something that you like learn when you become a software developer and use GitHub that like makes this suddenly understandable or is it as bad as I think it is? Yes, uh, it's, as it's, bad. it's somewhere in between. <laughs> uh, a software developer understands what to do with, with something like this and would start to look for, you know, patterns and, and un unfoldings and stuff like that. I, I, I'm a software developer and I'm, I, I'm inclined to just go, fuck this. Along well, the I, there's, there's structure there, right? Uh, the readme file is going to be the, the thing that you read. So you don't care about anything else until you read the readme file. And then um, if it's a bunch of text files, you go, okay, well, I'm going to have to download those, those text files and, and look at them. Um, it's, it's a, it's, it's like you, there's a sign outside of a building and it says automobiles and you open the door and it turns out to be the workshop and you see, you know, parts scattered all over the place. And that, you know, if you were looking to drive a car today, you're going, well, <laughs> I'm going to close the door and walk someplace else. Yeah. Um, it, it feels like the opposite of a mall where like a mall, you walk inside and then you could like wander through and like go in and yeah. out of other buildings. This yeah. feels like an opposite building where like you walk inside a room and then if what you are looking for is not in there, you have to leave and walk to the other side of the building. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> and true. go in That's another true. door. Um, but but if you were excited, um, it, it's like walking into the 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 work floor, the you know the 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 it's 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 like walking into the shop. And you're told that, like, uh, it's like walking into the automotive repair section um, rather than walking into the, the showroom. And, you know, if you were interested in fixing cars and, and you know, you were already, you know, you knew about uh, lifts and, and pneumatic drills and, and wrenches and stuff like that, you go, hey, I'm home. I'm going to pick up a wrench and do something. And if you were looking to drive a car, you go, why would you put me here? Why, why did the 
the sign on the front say there's cars here there's not cars i just see parts yeah it makes me wonder if there's a format for providing information that helps people go into the right door um that you know imposes the request on the guy who creates the signage uh, that says automobiles that that signage should also say automobile factory or shop or design or facility so the, the problem there is it's hard to determine a priori what you know who's going to understand the sign right automobile factory is going to be useful for people who understand factories and it's not going to be useful for people who don't understand factories and then you know for the person who's looking for a shop or a factory you know <clears throat> i it's, so a quick answer is is google <clears throat> if um if vincent you ended up there and you just googled wordnet um you would find you know an explanation of what wordnet was and why you give a shit um I, I had to I had to do that with uh, I, I started knowing that uh, Psych and Open Psych were something close, so it's like okay, so what is Psych? And I had to I was actually doing a lot of image searches. You know, can I see a picture of what Psych is? Can I see a picture of what a ontology and upper ontology is? Yeah, So you can find much better portals to what WordNet is. Mm. Um, I'm not sure that you can find better portals to what <laughs> Sumo is. The Probably because very it's... big graph of the taxonomy is, to me, the most helpful thing. Yeah. Um, because it's not like a KIF file, and then I have to go look up what a KIF file is to understand yep. what they're even doing. Yep. <laughs> um, and then you have to find a viewer for a KIF file, and yeah. Oh, is that right? Okay, because yeah, I was like, this like, is not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like clicking through these, it's just really funny. Just like the amount of, yeah, for me, the Kumu that I made, it was like, I want to build this in a way that it can be explained to like an eight-year-old. Like, yep. Um, yep. And I, I, I don't know, I feel like that's something that is much needed in, in the sort of like semantic ontology sense. And then in another sense, I feel like there's people that are just like, nah, dude, the AI are gonna figure it out. We don't really need to know how it works. <laughs> like, we don't need to visualize it. Like, stop with your pretty Kumu graphs. <laughs> <I'm just> like... <laughs> um, I, it's gonna be a long time since we're there. So, so having people like you make things that are, make sense is really important. Yeah, to Wendy's request for friction reduction. Pete, I, mean, I did. Pete. Sorry, Jonathan, go ahead. I was just say I feel like I'm coming over to the dark side when it comes to um, structured or unstructured data. Uh, I watched this talk and it kind of, I don't know, convinced me these were their like three assertions and they're philosophical which makes sense because it's not like provable but what they he said was unstructured data is actually hyperstructured data <laughs> it's a graph that contains much more structure than typical structured data and i'm like oh yeah that makes a lot of sense like it's <laughs> just so structured that we can't even understand the structure and yeah. so what i'm doing is in a sense like with trying to make like a structured ontology, it's it's actually um, less structured than you, um, but it is more uh, compressed and yeah. and therefore lossy. But it's more understandable because the yep. unstructured free the unstructured free text is so structured that it's not comprehensibly <laughs> structured. Yep, that's uh, really smart. Yep. Um, and we definitely need organization and, and structure to like communicate and collaborate.
yeah e efficiently yeah so then it's a matter of whether they make it explicit in, or implicit and and how you negotiate the understanding of it and all that kind of stuff thanks that'll be a fun one to watch <laughs> yeah yeah the third the second assertion the, the that graph is rich but it's a compression of meaning into a lossy format and that data science is essentially the decompression from this lossy format into a reconstituted form, yep. which you kind of need to like repeat three times to really understand, I feel like. Yep. <laughs> yep. That's a good one. And like all condensed or dehydrated food products, um, the reconstituted uh, form can taste like crap or it can taste great. Yep. Yeah. So, you Dep know, I'm... oh, Jonathan, you read it. De depending on how it was uh, concentrated. Some concentrations are actually really good when reconstituted, and others not so much. So I'm curious to see if I've accurately represented the um, data types and or data type relationships within Massive Wiki and Seriously. Or if you guys know what those are or have like written, mapped them out in some way. I, Massive Wiki, probably Seriously as well, is a kind of a general purpose tool. So there's the stuff that you record and then you have an implicit, usually implicit kind of schema in your head. And for me, maybe in Bill Anderson's head that, that says how to decode, you know, what's, what's there. So it's hyper-structured and then you have to ask me or Bill, you know, okay, so what's the, what's the schema here? Why did you format it this way? Well, I think what I'm referring to is the meta schema. So like, Massive Wiki has, um, you know, organizations or groups, or maybe it doesn't, maybe it just has users and like you have a user profile, right? And then users have um, wikis and then wikis have pages and pages have text and that's it. That's the structure. And then within that, everything else is, uh, there are other, there's other structure that is not uh, imposed, but you can't do anything outside of that structure. Like if you break that structure, you break massive wiki. So there yeah. is some structure that can't be broken. Yeah. Yep. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than, than, than what you just rattled off and not much more complicated. Yeah. And seriously, isn't even that complicated. Or it's more complicated. <laughs> hyper. It's less yeah. structured. How about that? <laughs> Which means it's more hyper structured. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but in, the work's all on you, right? It, it, what Vincent is creating uh, does a lot of work in addition to what people add for content. Uh, mine only allows you to edit, move things around, which I think is just what I want, but it doesn't do what you want, so. There, there's still these common patterns though, even with seriously, with it's like this, with the simplicity in the types of data, there's still, like, for example, um, like Jonathan, we were talking about interactions, um, right? And then within interactions, like there are certain, there are different interactions you could make onto a node in Seriously, whether that's like expand or contract or um, add to or, or like. So like uh, saying like you have a graph which has nodes 
and edges and then interactions and you can make an interaction on the node or the edge. Um, or I think you could make interactions between multiple nodes, which is a kind of cool, unique thing, right? Can't you like select multiple nodes? Yeah, but uh, uh, all you can do is move them. When you say it's still an interaction moving. Okay, all right. My arm is twisted. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm a limpet clutching to the rock called humility. <laughs> um, so, uh, so maybe another time we should we should try to map different things, Vincent, um, with you, like Mouse of Wiki or, or seriously or or sovereigns or you know meta project or OGM or yeah that'd be fun and I think what would be what we'd spend the longest time on is probably just figuring out when to create a new type and when to yep. uh, merge because the relationships yep. are similar enough like for example I have um visualizations or hmm, like pages, I don't actually even know what the best way to represent it is, um, but I think it's something like, let's see, see if I have it here, page. Okay, yeah, so platforms have pages and pages have different views um, but also visualizations have views and then the views have the data objects, data objects have types, et cetera, et cetera. And you interact with data objects. So like in Notion, you have like Notion, the platform, but then there's actually something in between here, which is like the wiki. Like you have different Notion um, dashboards and then those yep. have pages. And then each one of those pages have, um, yeah, different, views or just one view of like blocks which are the different like objects and you can move those you can interact with those blocks like you can move them you could delete them you could edit them um and they have the blocks have a type like is this a text block or an image block um so like this probably with one thing added would like i would say represent notion pretty well um but then it would get into semantics of like <laughs> Is it just a sub page or is it another thing? The yeah. like. I want to go on a tangent and take you up on your request for new data type suggestions. Uh, I want to, I wonder if we could add sovereign and uh, guild to your data types? So as I was hypothesizing before, um, I think pods, sovereigns, guilds, and teams are all types, are all instances of a group or a set of people. OK, fair enough. And in then, less, in less yeah. the relationship between a sovereign is um, like has different relationships than this, then I feel like it's the same, it's a different instance of the same thing. So like if a sovereign has um, resources and members and values and activities, and there are relationships between other sovereigns, and there's a language that people in that sovereign speak, and there's relation and um, the sovereign mm -hmm. might host events, then it's probably a group is my hypothesis. Okay, then um, to my understanding of what a sovereign in, is, it breaks that because it adds one more thing called self-governance. So the, the other, I think what would be interesting is to add a layer of all the deltas. So like add sovereign as a type and then lay out the, the differences yeah. between a sovereign and a group 
and yeah. then see are there more differences or like if there's only one difference or if there's 50 differences like if the ratio but i wonder if the relationship the the ratio between the number of differences and the number of similarities between those things means it should be the same yeah i'm I, with you it's, it's like yeah should we add self-governance as a field that all groups may have or not have. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, but if, if self-governance is enough to um, inspire it to be a, a subtype, a separate type, then I think guilds would be a subtype of sovereign because it has differences as Pete points out and I agree. Um, why add, so you asked for, uh, suggested, um, suggestions to add new types. Um, does my, um, curiosity about sovereign and guild fit into that, the spirit of your question, request, or, or were you thinking something else? Actually, my request, what I was trying to request is um, what layers would need to be added over the visualization to make it more helpful. So for example, saying we want to have a toggle that shows the differences between things was an answer to my own question that I came up with from posing the question, um, which I think would be helpful, is like... Ah. It's, it's not changing anything. It's just adding another layer that you can turn on or off. So another layer could be fields. So I could take the list of like 200 fields, which are already connected to data types. And I can add that as another layer on the graph that you can toggle on or off. So now you can see, okay, what are all the fields connected to group? Um, and then you could see which fields are connected to like four or five things. Like everything has like groups and projects both have an address. Um, and all of them have titles, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I, I wonder, Vincent, do you want to um, want to work on on maybe, I, I think a good next step would be just mapping different things, right? Would you want to do that on a flotilla call, like next flotilla call, or do you want to do a separate call? We could do that on a flotilla call. Yeah. I think that yeah, would be a good thing to week. do. So you mean mapping um, like a, an instance. So like in the same way that this is kind of the catalyst instance. Um, so let me, well, let me just- take, Taking massive wiki and, and or, or seriously and making a map of it. And then teasing it out that, you know, what's the difference between sovereigns and groups and, and guilds and probably some other things. Um, and seeing if that, you know, if that fits in the the upper ontology that you've got, or if it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what what I would do is I would add this field called platform. Yeah. And just take so these are the relationships, and I would tag all these relationships as catalyst. But yeah. then if then you could add, for example, um, you know, a wiki ha has um, pages and pages have, or I don't know, maybe this is documents, um, right? And documents have uh, objects. And then these can be tagged with massive wiki. And then we could add, add a toggle where you could sh toggle between yeah. the different platforms and see how it maps. Yeah, I like it. Um, I have to take off for another call. It's mm. been a super fun one, and I like the <laughs> I like the ontology stuff that you've got, Vincent. Mm. Thanks, Pete. Thanks for the help, Jonathan. Um, sure, um, I have some things to suggest to you if you want to hang out for another five. Yeah, I can do that. Hey, Pete.